Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Nicholas, for kindly inviting me. And congratulations that the legacy of Japan 400, which you and Timon so well chaired, um, lives on today and continues to be um, celebrated with such enthusiasm. Um, I'm most honored to have been asked to make a contribution to this conference um, held to mark the 400th anniversary of the first closed down of the Japan-British relationship in 1623. <clears throat> Compared with the literary, historical and diplomatic specialists who have spoken so far, I must confess I am ill-equipped to speak in such an erudite gathering of experts. Unlike any of the other speakers, both my first visit and my first posting to Japan were undertaken at the behest of a commercial organization, the former investment bank or merchant bank, as we called them in those days, Climate Benson Limited. <clears throat> in that sense, I can perhaps claim a closer association with William Adams than the distinguished diplomats and scholars who have spoken earlier can claim. When I moved to live and work in Tokyo in 1980, I had no concept of a first period of Japan-British partnership, to which the title of my brief remarks this afternoon refers. Indeed, when I arrived in Japan in 1980 to join a five-person representative office, of whom three people were Japanese, I didn't have any great community of expatriates to join. I didn't live in a compound that I wish we still retained. Um, and I was, strict, absolutely figuratively speaking, um, pushed in at the deep end. So what about the first, this first period of, of the Anglo, the Japan-British partnership? Well, William Adams, man of Kent, the pilot of the Dutch ship De Liefde, had been retained by the predecessor of the Dutch East India Company as a pilot. He was lucky to have been transferred from one of the other four ships, which set sail in 1598, the Hope, which was subsequently lost off Hawaii. De Liefde was the only ship which reached Japan, arriving off Hirado Kyushu in April 1600. Adam's letters back to England dated the 22nd of October 1611, one to his unknown friends and countrymen, Desiring this letter, he continued, Therefore, my desire is that my wife and two children may hear that I am here in Japan, so that my wife is, in a manner, a widow, and my children fatherless, which thing only is my greatest grief of heart and conscience, etc. Why did so many years elapse before he wrote? If he suffered such grief, grief as he claimed, why was he not driven to write to his wife earlier? It has been suggested that he surely would have written home earlier, although obviously the postal service in those days was rather different from what it became some 300 years later. Perhaps the Japanese authorities did not allow him to write, or they destroyed letters that he had written. We shall never know. Why were the British so many years behind the Dutch in establishing their first trading post in Japan? The lesson from this for traders and investors today is move fast. The early British traders were perhaps just too dilatory. I have seen time and time again that the first comers to Japan in every sector, when they have set up shop for the long term, and adapted their approach to the local market have been the most successful. The British, even if not the fastest off the block, could have decided to do something original and different. Adams had obtained permission from Tokugawa Ieyasu to set up close to Edo. 
If Captain John Surris and the East India Company had heeded Adams' advice, the first period might have witnessed a much more successful and profitable British trading port close to the commercial ca capital. What were the reasons why they preferred to hobnob with their fellow Gaikokujin competitors in Hirado, rather than attempt Dorchakka or put down roots in the thriving commercial center that Edo was becoming? Of course, I have already been challenged in that opinion by what we heard in the earlier session, that in fact, uh, the British trading post was correctly located in Hirado because the trade, the Hirado was much more accessible to South, Southeast Asian countries with which trade from Japan was more successful and more profitable. I think that in the case of Japan, even more perhaps than in other post outposts overseas, the second lesson for British traders and investors today is listen to the advice of your man on the ground. Do not be suspicious of his knowledge and affinity with an alien culture. I was often accused by my bosses in the head office of having gone native. But what I was trying to do was to present the best of what the City of London had to offer in terms of financial products and services, and indeed, values and business behavior in Japanese wrapping to make my customer, my company, as user-friendly as I could to my customers and prospective customers. At the same time, William has reminded me, because we were there at much the same time, of the Japanese uh, obsession with dochaka at that time, which was everywhere. There was a Dochaka committee of this and that, and I was one of the first foreigners to be uh, elected to the Keizai Doyukai and was instantly put on the Dochaka committee of that um, society. Um, the Dutch were, as has been said by many previous speakers, much more successful than the British in the first period. Perhaps a third reason for that was that they were much more flexible about the goods they sold. The British tried to sell their woolens in Japan even during the hot, humid summers. Nicholas McLean reminded me that Huntsman's, the Savile Row tailors, were disappointed on their first trade mission to Japan to have to take orders for pieces of grey cloth, nezumi iro, rather than for fitted suits. The lesson from this was that exporters need to research the Japanese market in a culturally sensitive way and be flexible. If you try to force your products on unwilling buyers, you will fail. Although Liz Truss, as International Trade Secretary and later Foreign Secretary, enjoyed good relations with many Japanese leaders and was responsible for the successful free trade agreement with Japan, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and the application for accession to the CPTPP, the Department of International Trade made a great song and dance about our successful negotiation to sell more cheese to Japan. <laughs> One reason why life in Japan suited me as someone who ca cannot stomach cheese, was that it is completely absent from the traditional Japanese diet. Even though the Japanese diet has become progressively westernized in recent years, I think the opportunities offered by cheese to make a radical difference to UK exports to Japan are rather limited. And I think the DIT's emphasis on cheese revealed a degree of cultural ignorance. There are other examples in recent years where HMG has not necessarily taken enough account of what is important in showing our long-term and full commitment to Japan as a partner which shares so many of the values which we hold dear. Last week, we started discussions on the trade bill introduced to Parliament to enable our accession to the CPTPP. One of the things the bill tries to achieve is to secure protection for geographic indicators this is a complicated question, especially when Sebiro is perhaps one of the oldest GIs prevalent in Japan, where it's long been the 
common Japanese word for a suit of clothes. During the first period, all Europeans thought in a very Eurocentric manner. Adams and the Dutch, however, did recognize that inter-regional trade was more profitable than long-distance trade based on Texel or Rotterdam. The British East India Company was less flexible and had failed to build a profitable business by 1623. The fourth lesson is think outside the box. The fifth and last most important lesson from the first period, which still applies today, is be patient <laughs> and commit for the long term. I have many times seen companies establish offices in Japan and then withdraw after only two or three years because they did not instantly achieve profitability. The British withdrawal after only a little over 10 years showed a lack of patience and staying power. They left the coast clear for the Dutch, who developed a lucrative virtual monopoly for over 250 years. Thank you. So